Okay. Um, so, just so you guys know, when we when we wrap up today, uh, I still have uh, quite a few homework one and two up here. Uh, I'll. I my plan is to keep them in the little space between my office doors. Those have been to office hours. Know that I've got this weird setup with like a door to the hall, door to the hallway, and a little closet-sized space before my office door. I'll leave that outer door unlocked and leave these in a box in between so you can stop by and pick them up. All right. Um, the grades are not written on them. That way you're all FERPA safe and uh, you can find the grades on ICON. So um, today we are going to be moving on from the of the safety of steady heat conduction, right? Up to now, we've talked about right, conduction in one dimension and two dimensions. One dimensional, we included uh, oops, Cartesian, cylindrical and spherical coordinates with and without heat generation, right? So we sort of beat this one to death. Um, in two dimensions, we talked about shape factors and numerical methods, specifically the finite difference scheme. Right, but the, the key thing that both of these chapters had in common was that any time we wrote the heat equation, okay, that first term that we canceled was the DDT. Right? We assumed it was steady state at all times, which sort of limits our ability to do a lot of meaningful calculations. Okay, so all have been considered to be steady. Um, so today we're going to be moving away from that and starting to include this idea of transient heat conduction, right? So transient conduction, we'll go ahead and just define as conduction involving both oops, changes in time and space. Okay. So this is really, you know, this is an important aspect of, of typical engineering problems because um, there aren't that many problems that are truly steady state, right? Um, you know, realistic problems might be uh, if you're doing metalworking or something, how long does it take to quench some, you know, piece of metal that you've just cast, right, in a, in a cold liquid? Uh, I might wonder how hot my uh, coffee here is going to be by the end of the lecture sitting on the desk. Or you might wonder how long it takes to charge, so to speak, um, a thermal energy reservoir. You know, these big, uh, basically big blocks of concrete or of gravel that they heat up uh, during warm times of the day or warm seasons and keep at some temperature to reuse that heat at a later time. All right, so there's the idea of adding and removal, removing thermal energy from a system in a way that doesn't mean the sum of the in is equal to the sum of the out uh, in every instance. So there are a number of methods that we can use to solve transient heat conduction problems. Right? Um, several approaches to the solution. Oops. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about today is what we call the zero D method or lumped capacitance. Additionally, there are exact solutions which require solution to uh, these partial differential equations and are not something that we're going to get into uh, in much depth in this class. Um, we will be talking about some simple sort of scale solutions for one-dimensional cases.
And then, of course, we have numerical methods, right? Which hopefully you've begin to see, begun to see from the uh, homework number four can be a once you sort of get a handle on them, they can be a powerful way to to brute force a problem that you can't solve by hand. <clears throat> so today's topic, as I said, is going to be this guy right here, the lumped capacitance method. So lumped capacitance. is a simple yet extremely useful tool uh, for doing basic transient conduction problems. Uh, and it hinges on one assumption. All right. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, oops. Oh my gosh. One central assumption. That is, we assume that the temperature of an object being heated or cooled is spatially uniform. That is, that is, you know, if we we're considering my cup of coffee here and we set it on the table. And we wait. The idea is right, we, we, we understand that it's going to be gradually losing thermal energy to the surroundings. Right? It's going to be cooling down. But if we assume that the temperature on the inside of that cup of coffee is the same everywhere, right? that the heat diffuses through the cup of coffee much faster than it leaves to the atmosphere, uh, then that opens the door to this particular type of analysis. Okay. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more later, but I wanted to preface with that. So uh, let's motivate with an example. Okay. Uh, let's consider a case where um, we're taking steel spheres. Okay. Steel spheres are being... Annealed, that is heated up to, um, you know, this process involves heating to 1150 Kelvin and then allowing to air cool to 400 Kelvin. Okay. This is something you might do before some further metalworking process on these, whether you're forming them into something non-spherical. It is to make them more ductile, right? Um, so let's draw, uh, let's say we've got our sphere. Um, this guy has a diameter of 12 millimeters. Okay, so fairly small. We're going to assume, okay, so D equals 12 millimeters. Uh, we're going to assume that it's sitting here in air at 325 Kelvin with a convective heat transfer coefficient of 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So T infinity equals 325 K H equals 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, We'll go ahead and say we have an initial and a final um, temperature, All right? So Ti, this would be where we're starting, would be 1150 Kelvin, right? Tf, where we're finishing, would be 400 Kelvin. Um, and we're going to assume typical uh, properties for steel here. So let's say rho is equal to... 7,800 kilograms per meter cubed. K is equal to, that's the conductivity, 40 watts per meter Kelvin. And C, a specific heat capacity of 600, yeah, joules per kilogram Kelvin. All right. 
So the idea here is going to be um, we're wondering how long is it going to take this thing to air cool from 1150 Kelvin down to its final temperature of 400 Kelvin. So when I said the idea is that we assume a constant temperature inside or a uniform temperature inside, um, I want to take another quick look at this. Uh, what this means is that we assume that the thermal energy inside of the sphere is migrating out to the edges right, and leaving via convection. That, that's, the, that's the mechanism. But inside of the sphere, it's occurring by conduction. right? And if we're saying that there's a uniform uh, temperature, and that basically means that Fourier's law, right, dt, d, anything is going to zero. Um, meaning that the only way that works is if we assume it has an infinite conductivity. That's not actually possible, right? We don't, there's no such thing as, a, as a, uh, an infinitely conductive material. Um, but the key here is that we'll show there's this uh, particular measure that allows us to look at the size of the object, the value of K here, and the value of H, and determine the relative importance of conduction and convection. Um, but the other important thing is that, right, because we're assuming there's no temperature gradient inside, Fourier's law doesn't actually work for us, which means we can't use the heat equation. We're kicking that to the curb. So we're going to take one step back and return to sort of the fundamentals. What was the first thing we covered in this class? the energy balance, first law of thermodynamics. So that's the way we're going to proceed with lumped capacitance is by setting up an energy balance that says right, e to the stored total energy, rate of change of stored total energy is equal to dot in total minus E out total, right? Well, we're going to go ahead and assume that there's no thermal energy going in, okay, because the thing is just sitting there cooling down. And the energy out, right, is simply going to be Q due to convection, right? Whereas this term here, okay. we talked about before how if you have, if you assume that all the energy contained in an object is thermal energy, that you can write E stored total um, as rho C, oh sorry, as M, the mass of that object, times C, its specific uh, heat capacity, right? So the rate of change of this object is going to be, oh sorry, rho C times T, uh, the absolute temperature of the object. So the rate of change is going to be M times C times DT, DT. So it's telling us that <laughs> the rate of change of the thermal energy in that object is equal to is decreasing at the rate that it's being convected away from the surface. M, of course, is equal to rho times the volume of the object, which in this case is going to be rho times 4 thirds pi r cubed. Um, but we'll go ahead and leave it just as, a, as, as rho v for now. So our expression becomes rho v c dt dt is equal to negative q convection, right? And then using Newton's law of cooling, which we covered in chapter one, this is negative h times the surface area of the object times the body's temperature minus 
the temperature of the surrounding air. Okay, in order to solve this, right, what we've done here is we've set up, essentially, we have a differential equation now because um, it is if the temperature everywhere inside the body is uniform, then we can assume that everything is, is Tb, represents the temperature of the body. There's also the temperature at the surface, etc. So what we have here is now a first order differential equation. We've got a diff uh, derivative of T, we have a T over here, and then we have a bunch of other stuff that ideally is known, right? Uh, so to make the solution a little bit easier, we're going to make a substitution. And this is the same substitution we made doing the fin equation. We're talking about extended surfaces. We're going to define this thing theta equal to Tb minus T infinity, okay? Or the excess temperature, if you will. And so with this comes the fact that d theta dt then is also equal to d t b d t. So if we plug these in, right, theta goes here, d theta dt, and plug in right there. We can rewrite our equation as rho v c d theta dt equal to negative h a s theta. Um, and in case you didn't catch it, um, a sub s here is just the external surface area of this sphere. All right. OK, so now we can reorganize things a little bit. Um, if we shift the uh, see if we shift the this term if we divide through we end up with rho v c over negative rho v c over h a s theta d t is equal to theta this is now um, termed a separable ordinary differential equation in other words, let's um, divide both sides by theta, multiply both sides by dt, and what we end up with is negative rho v c h a s 1 over theta d theta is equal to dt. Now this guy, right, just as with any other uh, separable differential equation like this, um, allows us to just integrate both sides. So we plant an integral. Oops, let's make that. Sorry, move that integral in here. And what we end up with then is T is equal to negative rho VC h times a s ln of theta plus some unknown constant of integration. Right. <clears throat> so just like we required two boundary conditions when we were solving a second order differential equation on space, in this case we're solving a first order differential equation on time. The fact that it's first order means we need one known condition this time. Uh, rather than a boundary condition, we call this an initial condition. You know, one initial condition required. Right. And so for that initial condition, it's convenient to go ahead and say, well, we know 
what the temperature is at time zero. All right, we're told that the thing is heated up. This, this sphere is heated up to 1150 Kelvin. And then we start the clock and start letting it cool. So at time, at t equals zero, all right, we know that tb is equal to 1150 Kelvin, or we'll say actually, TV is equal to, we said this is called TI, equals 1150 Kelvin. So theta I is equal to 1150 Kelvin minus the air temperature of 325 Kelvin, which works out to 825 Kelvin. So if we plug a zero in for the T on the left hand side, um, we plug in uh, our 825 Kelvin per L of theta. Uh, the idea is our zero on the left hand side means that C1 has to equal the quantity that's in the middle there. So I'm saving, I'll save us the algebra. Uh, but C1 then has to be equal to Rho V C over H A L N of theta I, the initial excess temperature. Which means that now if we plug that in, we get T is equal to negative rho V C H A sub S L N of theta minus L N of theta I or negative rho V C H A S L N of theta over theta I. So here's our first form of the solution right here. Um, this right is what we're looking for to solve this problem um, because this allows us to plug in if we know the initial temperature and we know the temperature we want it to reach or the excess temperature we want it to reach. So we'll plug those in on the right hand side and what we get is the amount of time it takes to cool to that temperature or to heat to that temperature for that matter. Um, before we plug in numbers, I want to solve for the alternate version of, of the solution, uh, which we get by exponentiating both sides. So raising, so, so taking e to the power of each side of the equation, we would get e to, oops. Um, oh, sorry, divide through by um, h, or by rho vc h, AS, so we end with T, negative T, uh, H, A, S over rho, V, C is equal to ln of theta over theta I. Now we exponentiate, raise both sides, um, negative T, H, A, S, rho, V, C equal to theta over theta i, which is equal to, if we go ahead and use our definitions of what theta is, this would be tb minus t infinity divided by ti minus t infinity. So if we solve for tb, right, which is ultimately what we're looking for, um, solve for tb, this works out to ti minus t infinity raised to the e, or times e raised to the negative t h a s over rho v c plus t infinity. So here's our second sort of form of the equation. The idea is known TB or theta. Get the time required to reach that temperature. And form two is known time. 
you can get the temperature reached in that time. Okay, um, I want to stress that really this is a shockingly simple solution for transient heat conduction, right? We've spent our whole semester so far dancing around this idea of transients. We've said, no, 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 everything's steady state and makes things easier. But this is the simplest differential equation that we have solved yet in the class, right? Um, so we are working here with the advantage um, that we've got this nice, simple, closed form expression um, where as long as we know the initial temperature and from that we can get the initial excess temperature, then we're set. We're golden. Um, so for returning to our example, right? For our example, um, we've got T I is equal to that eleven fifty Kelvin and T infinity equal to 325 Kelvin gives us that theta I is equal to our 825 Kelvin. We have TF equal to 400 Kelvin. T infinity we're going to assume remains at 325 Kelvin. So theta F is equal to Seventy-five Kelvin, and we keep seeing this uh, this quantity rho v c over h a popping up everywhere in the solution. So it makes sense to just calculate what that constant is. So in this case, this would be equal to seventy-eight hundred kilograms per meter cubed times four third pi. 0 0.006 meters cubed, that's our radius, times C, which is 600 joules per kilogram Kelvin, all divided by 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin, times 4 pi r squared, 6 which works out to a value of 468 seconds. All right. So this has units of time. It's a little bit weird, but it, makes, but it makes sense when you start looking at the way it fits into these equations. For example, um, up here, right, we have time divided by that quantity. So we end up with something dimensionless, which means that we are perfectly OK um, using that exponential. So um, anyway, moving on, um, I want to also point out that this is actually um, a ratio of two quantities that we know pretty well, or at least one quantity we know pretty well with one that we've, um, or we've mentioned a couple of times. So remember the expression for thermal resistance um, due to convection? Right, RT convection was 1 over H times the surface area, yeah. which we see here in the denominator of this constant. Um, this thing on top, right, this rho VC, which is equal to the mass times the um, specific energy uh, or specific heat con uh, capacity. Uh, this is what we know as this is the 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 magic behind this uh, approach. This is the lumped thermal capacitance. So this tells us how much heat um, or how much thermal energy is present. Um, per unit temperature, uh, and this tells us how much 
resistance there is to that thermal energy passing through a boundary by convection. So the ratio of these two okay, gives us this quantity. Um, so now to actually find the time it takes for to cool the sphere off from that 1150 to 400 Kelvin, we're going to go ahead and use this form one of the solution. Okay. So we could say time to cool is equal to right negative. 468 seconds times the natural log of theta f over theta i is equal to negative 468 seconds times ln of 75 Kelvin over 825 Kelvin. Okay, this quantity here works out to a value of about two, negative 2.4. And so, T cool comes out to 1,122 seconds, or just short of 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so when I mentioned before, right, that this all, the, the linchpin of this um, entire process is that we can assume that the temperature inside of that sphere is uniform. Um, the reason be there being is that that allows us to use this, uh, this lumped thermal capacitance, right, to calculate how much thermal energy is stored within. If the temperature is varying throughout the inside, then then um, you know then then I'd say you know e stored of the object no longer equals rho um, v c t right because what is t t is varying throughout the the entire uh, the object and so what we'd have to do in that case is use my eraser's not working. <laughs> Um, in that case, we would have to use an integral over the volume of T, X, Y, Z, right? Which completely gets rid of the, like, the, the simplicity of solving this because then we have to deal with conduction um, and we return to the heat equation. So um, the big question that I want to pose here and we'll spend a few minutes uh, answering is when is lumped capacitance actually valid? So to solve this, I want to we're gonna we're gonna go from our our steel sphere and we're gonna go back to a wall. Okay, the wall is is uh, not exclusive, but it's it's a nice demonstration case. So. Um, consider a you know once again we're going to consider steady state conduction. Um, I promise this is this is more of a of a tool than an actual analysis. Consider steady state wall. Oh, it's straight up and down. There we go. Um, we're going to assume it has some temperature. T S one on this side, T S two on this side, and then out here the air is at some temperature T infinity and with some thermal convection or some convective coefficient H. Inside, we're going to say that there is no heat generation um, and that the thermal conductivity is some value K, and that the wall is again L across. So we know, based on what we've seen here, right, if it's steady state and there's no heat generation, the temperature distribution across the wall is going to be what? Linear, right? It's going to be a straight line. And the temperature between TS1 and the surrounding air, you know, 
the convection uh, is going to lead to this thing we talked about called a thermal boundary layer. It's going to drop like this. Uh, so the question we want to answer is, right, so we have three temperatures present. We've got this, this T infinity. We have this TS1. We have this TS2. Um, we want to know what the relative drop is, you know, this delta um, one, sorry, I have those backwards. This should be one and two flipped. One and two. So we want to know the drop between two and infinity, and we want to know the drop between one and two. Okay. So the energy balance or the heat equation set up for this problem, right? is going to give us something that looks like um, negative k dt dx is equal to h ts2 minus t infinity, right? Or rather, this is actually, um, sorry, this is a energy balance performed here at the surface. So what this is telling us is that the Q conduction is equal to Q convection. All right. <clears throat> and because we're talking about steady state heat conduction with no energy generation, and this is just a straight line, that dtx turns into TS1 minus TS2, or negative TS1 minus TS2 over L. Right, so that cancels out with the negative k out front. So we have k, ts1 minus ts2 over l is equal to h, ts2 minus t infinity. So let's go ahead and solve then for ts1 minus ts2, that is this delta 1, 2 term, divided by T S two minus T infinity equal to right. It's going to be equal to H L over K. So I want I want you to understand what this is. Right? Is is this is the amount of temperature variation inside of the object relative to the amount of temperature variation between the object and its surroundings. So this lumped capacitance method, where we've said we want to assume a uniform temperature in an object, would suggest that we want this number to be very small. Right? We want the temperature to be have very little variation inside, and all of that temperature drop to be here at the, uh, the boundary. So we give this quantity here, this HL over K, a special name. We give it or the symbol BI. So BI is what's known as the BO number. And it defines um, the importance of convection relative to conduction. Another way we can write the BO number is if we took a look at this HL over K, right? We could write this as R double prime um, T due to conduction, that is the flux resistance um, of conduction divided by R double prime T convection. Um, and it is that if B, the BO number is equal to zero, right, this gives rise to the case where TS1 minus TS2 has to be equal to zero which is that uniform temperature that 
we're looking for. That is, so BO number equal to zero means that the lumped capacitance method is perfectly valid. All right. BO number approaching infinity tells us that TS2 minus T infinity is approaching zero, which basically means that all temperature variation is inside of the object. Meaning that the lumped capacitance is no good. So sketched out, right, if we consider our wall again, the case where the BO number is equal to zero corresponds to TS1 equals TS2 and the T infinity is out here. So we have a straight temperature distribution across and then our temperature drop where there's convection. On the other hand, BO number equal to infinity would correspond to a case that looks like TS2 is equal to the atmospheric temperature and TS1, the object, um, is not equal to TS2. Lumped capacitance good, lumped capacitance no good. All right. So as a general rule, if the BO number is less than 0 0.1, lumped capacitance is okay. Um, so the lumped capacitance method is loads easier than any of the other methods we have for transient heat conduction. So anytime you happen um, across a transient problem like this, the first thing you should do is calculate the BO number and figure out whether or not you can get away with doing a lumped capacitance analysis. Um, so let's rewind and let's check that example we just did with the steel spheres and make sure that the lumped capacitance, valid, uh, lumped capacitance analysis is actually valid. So for the sphere example, the first thing that we're going to ask, right, if BI is equal to, right, equal to HL over K, what do we use for L? Um, L equals what? Um, so L, right, if we're, if we're moving away from the wall, L was defined for that case where we had a planar wall. Um, in more general analyses, we're going to replace this L with what we call the characteristic length, or L sub C. And the way we calculate the characteristic length is the volume of an object divided by its surface area. Okay, so check. You know, we have length cubed divided by length squared. We should get something that has units of length. And the reasoning here should be pretty clear. The idea is if you were to take whatever object you're working with and, and squish it into a cubic shape that has the same volume, then this characteristic length would be the length of one side of that cube. All right. So for the case of our sphere, LC would be equal to Right, volume of the surface area, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed divided by 4 pi r squared, which works out to 1 third r. Okay. So for our spheres, r is equal to 6 millimeters. So this is 0 0.002 meters. Our BO number then works out to 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. There's H times 0 
meters. There's L sub C divided by K, which is 40 watts per meter Kelvin. And this works out very simply to be equal to 0 0.001, all right? Which is way smaller than that 0 0.1 that we got away with. Nice. So, the lumped capacitance method was a totally appropriate approach for solving this. So as I said, if you encounter a transient conduction problem, first step, calculate your BO number. Figure out your characteristic length, calculate the BO number, and hopefully you'll come up with a situation like this where it is smaller than 0 0.1 and you can justifiably apply this, uh, this lump capacitance analysis. Um, so the last thing here is, let's go ahead and say um, what would be the temperature of the sphere after five minutes and one hour. So this is 300 seconds and this is 3600 seconds. So for case A, right, TF would be equal to so in this, in this one, we're going to look at um, our form two of the solution, okay, which shows that we have this exponential decay in temperature. Um, so Tf would be equal to theta i e to the negative h a s over rho c v times t plus t infinity. Well, that's actually the general the general solution. So for A, where, oh my gosh, um, where T is equal to 300 seconds, plugging this all in would get us right, 825 E to the negative 0 0.002141 1 over second times 300 seconds plus 325 Kelvin, which works out to 760 Kelvin. And if we did the same process, but we just plugged in 3600 up here instead at T equals 3600 seconds, TF works out to a final value of 325.4 Kelvin. So if it starts at 1150, in five minutes it jumps down to 760, and in another 55 minutes it only gets down to 325. The idea is this shows us that it's this, we get this exponential decay in temperature. So the temperature of something that is cooling down under the influence of convection, it's going to look something like this, where it asymptotically approaches T infinity, and this is T initial. Okay, so that wraps up um, our the topic of lump capacitance. Uh, we're going to do some more work with the general lump capacitance. So rather than convection, we'll work in radiation uh, and heat generation in the next uh, lecture. Uh, and don't forget that the homework is due on Friday.